And this is recorded in paragraph 106 of the judgment. If I can just take you to that paragraph. And it starts from the third sentence. So the first circumstance. As pleaded by and back, the reality was that there had been a substantial overrun of cost from 665 million to 806 million leaving a large shortfall of funds available for completion. Indeed, E.C. Harris put the shortfall at 170 million, leaving aside EOT. Just to note there that the reference to shortfall is uh, the funds needed to complete the project are well in excess of the total amount of the restructured loan. Then, next sentence, DAS had no available funding for the shortfall or any part of it. The next event, there had also been a considerable degree of delay of around nine months, with work coming almost at a standstill. Then, there was no project manager and no plans to appoint one. Then, the underlying problem was the level of dispute between DAS and Intermass. There was no agreement on EOTs. DAS refused even to meet with Intermass. And then the last sentence of this paragraph, the alternative advanced by DAS of engagement of a new contractor would involve more expense and delay. So these facts are not disputed by the appellants, and we say individually and in combination, these facts have a material negative impact upon the appellant's ability to complete the project and service the loan. We said it's very difficult to reach any other reasonable conclusion. And the extreme nature of these facts is reflected in Sir David Steele's finding in paragraph 107 <coughs> of the judgment. Where he says, in my judgment, and I am not sure the proposition is controversial, a view based on that material that there was thereby a material adverse change could be readily accepted as honest and rational. But I would go further and hold that it is right to infer that it was not just reasonable, but inevitable, that any competent bank would form the opinion that there had been a material adverse effect based on its internal analysis and the advice received from E.C. Harris in late 2014 and early 2015. I'm just pausing there. The very fact that the bank has terminated and accelerated the loan against those undisputed facts is evidence from which the requisite opinion can be inferred. Absent any evidence of an ulterior motive, it's reasonable to infer that the bank terminates and accelerates the loan because it believes that the borrower will not or cannot repay the loan. In our case, we have evidence of the opinion. We have consistently said there is ample evidence to show that the bank had the requisite opinion as at the date of the notice. So I'll move on to having a look at that evidence to counter the opponent's argument that there was no evidence to support an inference that the bank had the requisite opinion. There may be a shortcut which I'll address first. Um, this morning, uh, Mr. Thomas said <coughs> at paragraph 23 and paragraph 24 of the transcript of this hearing that the opponent places great weight on the fact that there was no direct evidence. The General Counsel is giving evidence. The General Counsel signed the defence. One of the world's leading law firms are acting. Mr. Thomas said, and they do not feel able to write these three lines in the amended defence or a witness statement saying the opinion was formed within the bank that there was a material adverse effect. If I could just ask you to turn to paragraph 98 of the judgments.
Now here, Sir David still recalls, Ember did not rely on material adverse effect in its notice, nor was it directly relied upon in the original defence as justifying the provision of the notices. However, he goes on to point out that paragraph 57 D2 of the original defence reads as follows, B and C, from 29 January 2015, in the reasonable opinion of the defendant, the issuance of the certificate of non-performance by the engineer and or the subsequent escalation of the dispute between the claimant and Intermass, as set out in paragraphs 52 and 53 above, had a material adverse effect for the purposes of clause 23.11b of the facility agreement. And then C, from 1 March 2015, again, in the reasonable opinion of the defendant, the claimant's failure to renew the engagement letter of Hill International as project manager and or appoint a replacement project manager had a material adverse effect for the purposes of clause 23.11b of the facility agreement. If I can ask you just to pick up the um, defence, which is in volume one, tab eight. And I'll, just to make a good point, I will just take you to page 116 is the page that is quoted, has the passages that are quoted in the judgment. My apology, volume 1, tab 8. Yes, and then page 116. Here, Roman numeral 2 and B and C are the passages I've just quoted and which are quoted in, in Sir David Steele's judgment. And then I'll just ask you to turn to the last page of this defence, <coughs> just to make a good point that there's a statement of truth, as you'd expect. I believe that the facts stated in this amended defence are true. I am duly authorised by the defendant to sign the statement, Samar Abdel Haq, the General Counsel of the Bank. So that's a potential shortcut on, on the terms set out by Mr. Thomas. However, of course, we have, we say, an abundance of evidence from which the inference of the requisite opinion can be drawn. <coughs> so, Sir David still mentions at paragraph 107 of the judgment, he refers to the internal analysis of the bank and the advice received from E.C. Harris in late 2014 and early 2015. Now, a lot of this evidence is helpfully summarised in the judgment. If I can take you to paragraph 27 of the judgment. The judgment records that E.C. Harris reported to the bank deteriorating relationship between DAS and Intermass in an email dated 3 December 2014. It reads, the main contractor and its MEP subcontractor have become increasingly assertive and aggressive in nature in order to force the employer to accept and pay claim EOT amounts. This involves premature removal of site resources and placing procurement on hold until the EOT is resolved both could be deemed a breach of contract. Over the page, paragraph 31 of the judgment. This is an internal note of the bank, dated 5th of February. It reports an update and the second bullet point. An engineer certificate was issued on 
15, certifying to the project owner that he may terminate the employment of Intermass after giving 14 days notice for failure to comply with his obligations under the contract. And then strategy and action plan, the next row. We clearly explain to the client that NBAD does not recommend termination of Intermass and that this will lead to stopping our finance. However, he seems to be moving toward termination of Intermass and Hill International. And the next paragraph. We will meet with the client this week to stress the bank's stance against termination of the main contractor and project manager given the advanced stage of the project, 60% completed. Over the page, paragraph 32 of the judgment. <coughs> Here we have an EC Harris report for January 2015, which includes a strong warning against terminating Intermass. And I'll just take you to, I think it's the second, the third sentence. Should the employer terminate the contractor, it will have to engage a replacement contractor to complete, usually at a premium to the price agreed with the first contractor, and it is inevitable that there will be some additional delay to completion, and therefore the date when the employer sees a return on the investment. Paragraph this. Doesn't this support uh, what uh, Mrs. Thomas was saying, that there was no, you know, no material, what could be was material? I say quite the opposite. Uh, this is evidence of E.C. Harris reporting to the bank and the bank understanding that these problems with the project are going to lead to increased costs, so more than the loan, <coughs> completion of the project, and delays, delaying the repayment. Going back to your original statement. Yes, yes. So then you have to see all of this evidence through the prism of a project finance loan. So any increase in cost, any delay to completion, threatens the cash flows, which threatens repayment of the loan. Well, this one is undoubtedly useful, but Mr. Thomas has probably pro properly acknowledged that, would have, that it would have been open to have reasonably formed the requisite opinion. His complaint is whether or not it could be found that it had been formed. So uh, there's a limit to just going through to support the proposition that it could have been performed. Uh, formed. The question is, was it? The exercise on which I'm engaged is to look at what Sir David Steele relied upon by looking at the reports that were given to the bank by E.C. Harris and then the bank's own internal analysis of those reports in order to make the point that they did have the requisite opinion internally by 21 May. The, the mere fact that there was material on which they could have formed the opinion, on which it was open to them to, to form the opinion, doesn't answer what is being put by Mr Thomas. Indeed, from one point of view, and I suspect this lies behind what Justice Zaghi has just been saying is, the more obvious it was that there was a material adverse effect, but it was not relied on, the more one can perhaps be disinclined to infer that the opinion was formed. Well, the, my response on that is you, you have to assess from what the bank was told and from what the bank did, what its state of mind was, what opinion it had at that time. And if you look at how obvious the facts are, look at the actions which the, which the bank took, I think that makes good the point, and I, I hope I can make the point by taking you to the evidence of the bank's internal analysis and witness evidence, which shows what they're being told matches up to their interpretation which matches up to their action in terms of protecting their interests, which is interest in either getting the loan repaid or avoiding the situation where the security that's available for the loan is, is not going to cover the amount of the, the loan that's been advanced. Well, please press on. Shall I proceed? Okay, thank you. OK, 
Okay, at paragraph 33, PC Harris reports that the appellant is about to lose the project manager and the increased risk that this generates to the project. <coughs> and I'll turn now to a piece of the bank's internal analysis um, or uh, the bank's own analysis position by looking at paragraph 35 of the judgment, which is the bank's meeting minutes of the meeting that took place with the appellant on 23rd February. Which, which records <coughs> the GC general counsel of the bank has explained to the appellant at the second paragraph. Mr. Samer explained that a notice of termination would provoke Intermass to obtain an injunction to the court of first instance and engage in arbitration. The legal proceedings to revoke the injunction or obtain a favourable arbitration verdict could take a long time. Meanwhile, this would bring the project to a complete standstill and admitting a new contractor will be impossible. Therefore, an amicable resolution with the contractor is recommended. If I can take you to Mr. Abdul Hack's witness statement, that's in volume 2, tab 17. And paragraph 14 refers to the uh, 23rd February 2015 meeting, and I, I, I would also rem remind the court that um, Mr. Abdelhat was not cross-examined by the appellant. Um, paragraph 15, we have Mr. Abdelhat's witness statement, uh, witness evidence. Prior to the meeting, Mr. Sokon informed me that Mr. Al Mahari had said that he wanted to terminate the construction contract with Internet. This information was a major concern to me, since I considered that the termination of the contract would be likely to result in substantial delays, cost increases, and complications for the project that could lead to an impairment of the loan. So where Mr. Thomas seeks to rely upon uh, the distinction between mere concern and something more serious, I point you to the wording that Ms. Abdul Hack uses in this paragraph. This was a major concern. And he refers to impairment of the loan. So this is witness evidence of the bank forming an opinion, the requisite opinion, as early as 23 February 2015. Okay. Okay, I'll just pick up a, a few more points from the judgment before returning to Mr. Abdul Haq's witness statement. Um, paragraph 36 of the judgment, this simply recalls the factual developments that, that the project manager's contract expired on 28 February 2015, and on 8 March 2015, Intermass suspended all work due to non payment. Then, paragraph 37 of the judgment records an internal note prepared by the bank of a meeting with the appellant on 14 March 2015. And paragraph one, second sentence, the appellant stated that he had advised the GCE that there is no potential reconciliation with Intermass, the main contractor. 2A, we explained to the client that the options now are as follows. A, status quo situation. 
If no resolution with Intermass is reached and no tangible progress on site is achieved, this may lead to the account being classified as per the UAE Central Bank, is that acronym, and NBAR taking all necessary actions to safeguard its rights, which would usually include foreclosure on the project. And then item C, the, the, the bottom two paragraphs. We reiterated our earlier concerns regarding the change of the main contractor at this juncture of the project, 61% completed, and the issues that might entail on site. However, he insisted that he will be taking the appropriate measures to mitigate all said issues. We explained that the delays have increased the financing cost and will probably, probably result in an escalation of the construction cost. He disagreed about the construction cost increase and insisted that the new development budget will be within the originally approved budget. <coughs> If I can take you back to Mr. Abdul Haq's witness statement, and to paragraph 25. This records that the bank invited the appellants to attend a meeting with Intermass and the project manager and senior members of the bank. Paragraph 26 records that the appellant refused that inv invitation. Now, paragraph 28 is relevant to the bank's opinion at this state uh, in time. You see, the, the General Counsel writes, as a result of the appellant uh, refusing to attend this meeting, the, the General Counsel says, I was particularly concerned that Mr. El Meheri and Intermass were no longer able to communicate with each other and that Mr. El Meheri had taken a position that made it impossible for NBAN to find an amicable solution to his disputes with Intermass. From this date, it was clear to me that if Mr. El Meheri did not change his position, there were likely to be negative implications for the completion date and cost of the project and Mr. El Meheri's ability to comply with his obligations under the loan. So again, we say that's more evident, witness evidence which is unchallenged of the bank forming the opinion that there was a material adverse effect. Uh, paragraph 30, this records that the General Counsel discussed the matter with the Chairman of the Bank. And it's the last two sentences. I told the Chairman that I considered that Mr. Al Meheri's refusal to attend any meeting with NBAD and Intermass was unreasonable and that the interests of NBAD were being jeopardised. The Chairman asked me for my advice and I said that NBAD needed to take steps to protect its interests. The chairman agreed with me, but we also agreed that NBAD wanted to resolve the matter and that litigation was to be the last resort. And paragraph 31 records that um, the general counsel uh, informed Mr. Sokon on 18 March 2015 that um, he had clearance from the chairman that the bank could move forward to protect the bank's rights. And Mr. Abdul Haq adds in that email, a change of contractor at this time is expensive and time consuming. So again, repeated references to increasing costs and delays. And then paragraph 32 and overpay 32E. This is the bank repeating its request that the appellant attends a meeting with the bank and all other relevant parties in, in order to put in place on a consensual basis a comprehensive plan to put the development back on track. And then paragraph 2F records the bank's first written warning to the appellant that it may exercise its rights under the loan. And this warning was repeated multiple times in, in subsequent correspondence. This is the first written warning. NBAD reserves any right or remedy it may have now or subsequently in connection with or arising from any defaults and events of default under the amended and restated facility agreement, including without limitation its right to enforce all or part of the security granted to NBAD under and in relation to the amended and restated facility agreement. Paragraph 34 over to page 319. 
This is recalls the bank's letter to the appellant dated 24th March 2015. The bank is repeating its request that the appellant attend the meeting with the bank and Intermass. And the phrase that's repeated is, in order to get the development back on track. Paragraph 35. This records Mr. El Meharry's letter dated 25 March 2015, in which he makes clear to the bank that, in his view, Intermass can't continue on the, con on the contract as uh, on the project. And he says, and Mr. Abdul Hack says it was clear to him there was nothing that Enbad could do to change his mind. Now, paragraph 36 is evidence of the bank's opinion from this point in time. It reads in the witness statement, I considered Mr. Al Mahari's response to be highly unsatisfactory and disappointing. I and others from Envad had already met with Mr. Al Mahari separately, most notably our meeting on 23 February 2015, and had made clear to him that any termination of Intermass as the contractor would be likely to have very serious negative implications for the project and lead to defaults under the loan. I was concerned that Mr. Al Mahari's refusal to engage in any discussion involving Intermass made it impossible to achieve any resolution or sensible plan for completion of the project. We go to paragraph 39. This is the bank's letter to the appellant dated 22 <coughs> April 2015. You see Mr. Abdelhak in the second sentence says, in order to make clear how critical the situation had become, this letter was signed by the CEO and myself. And the letter states, we note that as of the date of this letter, you have not proposed any measures to put the development back on track, nor have you accepted our repeated request to meet with NBAD and the contractor. And then the second to last paragraph. If you decline the invitation to meet with NBAD and the contractor, NBAD will be forced to take steps under and in accordance with the amended and restated facility agreement to protect its position and interests. Paragraph 40 is the next letter from the appellant dated 26 April 2015. And paragraph 41 is further evidence of the bank's opinion. Mr. Abdelhak says, I discussed Mr. Al Meharry's letter dated 26 April 2015 with the CEO, and we agreed that Mr. Al Meharry appeared to think that NBAD was bluffing. The CEO and I agreed that the NBAD legal department and risk department needed to make a decision on whether to begin formal action to enforce NBAD's rights under the loan in order to protect NBAD's interests. When, when was that? What was the date then? This is in response to Mr. Almahari's letter dated 26 April 2015. 26 April. What, when, when was that letter dated? The one you just read. Mr. Almahari's letter was dated 26 April 2015. 26 April. And paragraph 41 of Mr. Abdul Hatt's witness statement refers to his, the bank's response to that letter internally. So the discussion between the general counsel and the CEO. So we say that all of this evidence that I, I've taken you through uh, is sufficient evidence to allow Sir David Steele to infer that the bank had the requisite opinion. So just as a reminder, paragraph 107 of the judgment, Sir David Steele says, the requisite opinion can be readily inferred from the unsuccessful steps taken to seek to resolve the disputes between DAS and the contractors in the face of the potential for failure to complete the project and service the loan. So Sir David Steele says the material adverse effect opinion is evident from the evidence I've taken you through. However, he, he notes, and this is really the, the appellant's sole point, that there was no contemporaneous record referring to clause 23.11, or, or using the phrase material adverse effect. But Sir David Steele says, 
accepting that mere expressions of concern are not enough, it would nonetheless be irrational to distinguish the bank's analysis of the situation taken with the expressions of justifiable and pressing concern by the bank and its advisors as to the ability of DAS to complete the project and service the level of debt from a clear opinion that there was a material adverse effect by the time of the demand by NBAD. Now, I haven't even taken you to the specific bits of evidence that Sir David Seale relies upon in paragraph 109 of his judgment. So the first is uh, Mr. Sokon's internal email of 7 May 2015. And it's to the Group Chief Credit Officer and the Group Chief Risk Officer. So these are people within the bank who have the final uh, decision or approval of uh, terminating and accelerating the loan. You see, Mr. Sokon is informing these people there's, there's no progress on site, and no plan for progress. The cost completion is likely to increase to 800 million, so in excess of the total loan amount of 669 million. And also, there's an additional 150 million in finance costs that need to be serviced. Then in paragraph B, so David still refers to Mr. Sokon's second witness statement. I just want to, to dwell uh, for a moment on that first sentence, which, which records how the decisions on termination and acceleration are made within the bank. Mr. Sokon says, the decision to accelerate Mr. Albanieri's loan was a collective decision by NBAD's risk department with support of NBAD's legal department. And this witness statement also records his discussion with <coughs> Mr. Yazbek and Mr. Chowdhury. The sentence reads, we agreed that Mr. Almahari was in serious breach of his obligations under the loan and that the situation would continue to deteriorate since the project had effectively come to a standstill without any realistic budget or any program for completion. And then the last sentence, by 21 May 2015, I and my colleagues in NBAS risk department and NBAS legal department were concerned that Mr. Almahari would not be able to complete the project at all and that he would default on his obligations to repay the loan. Now, paragraph C here, I think, explains more clearly um, why the completion date and construction costs were the key to determining for the bank the appellant's ability to repay the loan. So the concern as to the failure to complete the project on time or on budget is effectively a concern that the appellant would not be able to repay the loan. And this evidence in cross-examination was given in the context of Mr. Sokon's email dated 7 May 2015. And he explains from the second sentence onwards, the way we approach the project financing of this nature is based more on the cash flow rather than the collateral value. And indeed, the collateral value is based, actually, on discounted cash flow of the project, which is the cash flow which will come from the rental of the hotel after the income of the hotel, after the completion of the project. This is why, when we looked at the restructuring of this case, we had two risks involved. One is completion risk, the other one was the repayment risk. And as long as the completion is not adhered to, as per the timelines that we have set, Obviously, the value of the collateral upon completion, which is 1.28, will not be an actual value because there is no discounted cash flow coming from the hotel. Over the page, this is where our main concern was. From a financial perspective, it didn't seem feasible anymore to add more financing to this project because simply of the fact that even if it's completed in terms of construction, the income which will be produced will not be sufficient to deal with the burden of the debt itself. <coughs> this is a clear opinion that the costs and the delay have got to a stage where it's simply not possible for the appellants to repay the bank <coughs> in the opinion of the bank at this time. We say this is clearly sufficient to allow Sir David Steele to draw the in inference that the increase in the construction cost, cost and the delay to com completion of the construction will materially impair the ability of the borrower to perform or observe any of his repayment or other material obligations. Now, paragraph D is the 
uh, quote from Mr. Abdul Haq's unchallenged witness statements. And this is evidence from the senior lawyer within the bank that the bank did have the requisite opinion as at the date of the notice. He says, one additional default that was within the events of default at this time, although not mentioned in the notice of demand, was an event of default under clause 23.11, material adverse change of the amended facility. I say this because by the date of the notice of the demand, I and my colleagues at NDAD had made clear our concern that Mr. Al Mahari's decision to replace Intermass as the contractor would materially impair his ability to complete the project on time, on budget or at all. I believe that the effects of Mr. Al Mahari's decision came well within the scope of the material adverse effect under the loan. Now, as a lawyer, we say Mr. Al Hack or well, you should assume Mr. Abdelhak did understand what he was saying in these words in his witness statement. He says there was a material adverse effect, event of default, as at the date of the notice. That's his evidence, which is unchallenged. Now, Mr. Thomas will try to, uh, has tried to argue that this is just a mere expression of concern, but coming after the weight of the evidence that I've taken you through up to this point, we say simply that's, that's untenable. In any event, we say it was open to Sir David Steele to say, based on those facts, the inference of the requisite opinion could be drawn. This formation of the opinion of a material adverse effect, when is this opinion to be formed? Is it before the issue of notice of termination? Oh, how soon, how long, how long? Well, I, I think it's accepted between us that you, there needs to be um, a finding of fact that the requisite opinion was as at the date of the notice or prior. As at the date of the notice. And uh, if you look into the definition of material adverse effect, what's as important as you repeatedly say is to the ability of the borrower to be paid. That is the criteria. Yeah. Well, it's actually even wider than that. It's, it's any obligations, but it specifically refers to repayment obligations. So it's, it's my submission that Sir David Steele's decisions, his factual findings on material adverse effect are, are unassailable based on this evidence. So I'll, I'll pause there before I'm moving on to the conditions of subsequent arguments, in case you guys have any questions or comments. So factually, you're relying on the finding of facts by Mr. Justice Steele? Absolutely, Your Honour. Yes, please continue. Okay, with the conditions <coughs> subsequent, um, today the Steele in the judgment takes the following two-state approach. Was there an event of default? And then secondly, if there were events of default, were any of these waived by the bank? If I could take you to um, paragraph 21 of the judgment. This is simply a, a helpful shortcut to uh, remind the court of the uh, documents that we are talking about that needed to be provided by 30 September 2014. So number one, a duly executed original of construction <coughs> contract assignment. Two, a duly executed original of contractor's insurances assignment. And number four, a copy of the construction contract as amended, duly executed by all parties thereto. Certificate is true, complete and accurate by a duly authorised officer or borrower. Now, paragraph 22 of the judgment records um, some key provisions in relation to these conditions subsequent. So, 5.3a. This states that the documents must be in a form 
and subsequent sales satisfactory to the lender. <coughs> My point there is it's, it's not for the borrower to dictate what is satisfactory to the, to the lender. And then over page 5.3b, non-provision constitutes an event of default without any grace period. So strictly, if you don't meet the 37-2014 deadline, there is an event of default. Now the, the judgment records at paragraph six, 63 that the appellant's case on conditions subsequent, I quote, underwent something of a sea change at the trial. I'll just take you to the transcript. If I can ask you to take volume three, and tab 25, and page 461. I'm looking at page 76 of the transcript here from lines 23 and then over the page down to page 10 on, on page 77. And this is Mr. Thomas in, in opening submissions confirming the position as at that time. There wasn't actually an amended contract, so there can't have been. We can't be in breach by not supplying something that just didn't happen. And obviously. I'm, I'm sorry, you, I sorry. asked you. I'm sorry. Um, page 76 of, of the judgment. It should be in the bundle, page 461. Yes, I've got page 76. And then down to line 23. And it's the end of that sentence. It begins, which of course. Ah, thank, thank you. I'm with you, yes. So I was being from the, There wasn't actually an amended contract, so there can't have been. We can't be in breach by not supplying something that just didn't happen. And obviously, there couldn't have been an assignment of that either. So the point that's now relied upon seems by the defendant is the one remaining matter, that we did not provide them with the original of the contractor's insurance assignment. That is, to an extent, a fair point. We did not provide them. It's accepted with a document in that form. But what we did provide was that the contractor's all risks insurance was in the name of the bank. Now, this is a, an admission in, in opening submissions that the appellant did not provide the documents that were required to be provided as conditions subsequent number one, two, and four. And uh, we had understood that the appellant had uh, abandoned its argument that the conditions subsequent obligations only applied if such documents came into existence. So this, in effect, is, is an argument that you should interpret the conditions subsequent as somehow being options. So it would require you to read these conditions subsequent uh, obligations as meaning, well, if you happen to enter into an amended construction contract or an assignment of a construction contract or the relevant insurances, then in those circumstances you have to provide the documents as conditions subsequent. But we say that that argument is just untenable. Um, if those arguments are abandoned or, or defeated, then the appellant's opening submissions is clearly an admission that there were events of default in each case. However, um, by the time of closing submissions, the appellant had developed new arguments which are unpleaded, and it's correct that we didn't take any technical pleading points on that, other than to point out they were unpleaded <coughs> to demonstrate the weaknesses of those arguments. Now, I'll, I'll start with condition subsequent number four as Mr. Thomas did. And this is the requirement to provide a copy of the construction contract as amended, <coughs> duly executed by all parties thereto. Now, it's uh, our position that condition subsequent is a prerequisite for the satisfaction of condition subsequent number one. You can't have an assignment of the amended construction contract without first having the amended construction contract. And the amendment to the construction contract was necessary in order to reflect the realities of the project as those appeared after restructuring the loan. So a different price, the requirement to have an effective project manager appointed, and the completion date. Now, Sir David still relied upon two documents to establish non-compliance with condition subsequent number four. The first is amendment number one to the contract, which is common ground was never signed by Intermax, so there was no amendment number one. 
And then amendment number two, where it's common ground that this was provided after the deadline stipulated for commission subsequent. At paragraph 80 of the judgment, Sir David Steele says, this, the short point is that amendment number one was never provided and amendment number two was provided late. Now, focusing on um, amendment number one, the key issue, uh, as we see it, is whether amendment number one was a necessary amendment to the contract. Now, paragraph 68 of the judgment, so they yeah, still so show that what, what do you really mean by that? Is this some reflection of a construction of the ARA, which means that condition number four, by talking about the amended contract means a construction contract as necessarily amended. Is that the starting point? Correct, Your Honour. It, it, it makes no sense uh, for there to be a condition subsequent obligation to provide an amended construction contract unless that amended construction contract reflects the new terms of the construction project as at that time. Well, nonetheless, one might need to look at something to see whether that is a proper construction. This, I think, lies behind something that I took up with Mr. Thomas, and he foreshadowed you'd be making this sort of argument. But I think you need to start earlier than you have presently started. In other words, why do we construe it in the way you say? Um, well, I, I'll come on to the importance of the project manager um, through amendment number one to make the point that this was uh, necessary and contemplated as necessary by the parties as at the date of the amended uh, uh, facility um, But before, I, before I, I get to that point, I just would like to note paragraph 68 of the judgment um, just records um, that amendment number one provided for the appointment of Hill International as the project manager and amendment number two provided for the amended construction price. Okay, incorrectly at 68, it refers to EC Harris as the project manager, it should be Hill International. Um, and so David still goes on to state in this paragraph, both were accordingly fundamental as to the performance and scope of the works to be undertaken by Intermass thereafter. So Sir so David Steele considers that these amendments are fundamental. And we say that was open to him, indeed it was right of him, because it was critical to the project for a project manager to be appointed and for that project manager to have an effective role in controlling the, the rate of progress of the project. If I can take you to amendment number one, and that appears in volume seven. And it's tab, at tab 68, and it's a, it's a few pages in, about 1518, page where it begins. I'm referring to is at the bottom of page 1518 and it, it sets out the amendment to the construction contract. The project manager shall be appointed by and be responsible to the employer for all program related services and carry out such duties and exercise such authority as may be delegated to him by the employer. Uh, the first point I would, I would say in response to the, the issue raised by um, Mr Justice Giles is the very fact that the appellant has asked Intermass to sign this amendment number one is an indication that the appellant considered it necessary to amend the construction contract to provide for the effective appointment of the project manager. 
And I'll, I'll take you to the cover letter, which appears a few pages back, uh, 1515. And this is the appellant's letter to Intermass, dated 15 June 2014. So this is well before the date of the uh, amended facility agreement and after the date of the facility agreement letter I took you to. Um, and the key provision or the key text in this letter is the last paragraph, which states, more details of Hill International's duties and responsibilities will be formalised at a later date. A responsibility matrix will be issued to all parties as soon as possible. And in due course, an initial progress meeting will be organised to introduce as many stakeholders as possible. Now, if I can take you to Intermass's response to that letter, that is at page 1520 in the same tab. This is a letter from Intermass to the appellant dated 23 June 2014. And it's the second part of the first sentence I would refer to. We advise that we are unable to sign this document at this time, as we will need to see and agree the responsibility matrix, as mentioned in the second paragraph of the letter, prior to signature. And then just over the page, you'll see a, a, the beginning of a list of comments and objections that Intermass has in respect of the proposed amendment number one. And I'll just take you to the wording which just appears above the, the bold wording three quarters of the page down, amendment to contract number one, just above that, that sentence. The contractor reserves the right to object to part or all of the proposed matrix and such objection shall be binding on the parties. So this is evidence of the Intermass rejecting the proposal that the project manager should have some new authority introduced to the project over Intermass. Now I'll take you to another letter at um, page 1513. This is a letter from Intermass to the appellant dated 28 October 2014. So this is well after the deadline for conditions subsequent. And again, this is Intermass rejecting the proposal that they sign amendment number one. The last sentence, please be advised that we do not accept the proposed amendment. So based on that evidence, we say it was reasonable for Sir David Steele to consider that amendment number one was a required amendment to the construction contract. Uh, the failure of the appellant to provide an agreed signed version of this amendment number one is a clear breach of conditions su or the relevant conditions subsequent obligation. Your argument might be improved if there's some evidence that the bank was made privy to these negotiations to have Hill become a project manager, i.e. that at the time of the ARA, or while it was being prepared, it was understood by between the bank and the DAS that this was a necessary event, as distinct from just being a sort of free-floating necessary event. Can you help on that? Um, on, your, on your narrow point, we do not have any evidence from the bank which states and recalls that the bank appreciated it was a necessary amendment to the construction contract. But of course, we do have evidence which recalls that the appointment of the project manager was absolutely critical to the project. But I don't think that evidence addresses your honest point. But is there any evidence the bank was aware that these endeavours to have the contract amended were underway? You see, it, it, unless I misunderstood it, it appears that in June 2014, um, DAS was proposing an amendment to Intermass. If DAS said to the bank, we are we, are, we have put forward an amendment to Intermass, we're trying to get the, the amendment signed. 
and that would explain such condition subsequent number four. Is there evidence of that kind? There's evidence that um, the bank was informed of this attempt to negotiate amendment number two and number one, but after the deadline of um, 30 September. Okay. I don't have evidence of that before in respect of this specific condition subsequent. We, we do have it in respect of other condition subsequent documents, which I'll come on to. But before leaving this amendment number one, uh, there is a secondary point arising from the fact that the appellant provided the bank with a copy of amendment number one that was only signed by the appellant and not in its mass <coughs> after the date of, of the condition subsequent deadline, so after 30 September. We say an unsigned amendment cannot be satisfactory to the bank. So this is arguably a separate breach of the condition subsequent obligation. You'll remember clause 5.3a requires that condition subsequent documents are delivered in a form and substance that is satisfactory to the lender. But, but this doesn't matter. I mean, there is either a breach when something wasn't delivered on the 20th of yeah. the 30th of September, or there wasn't. Yeah, I, I accept that point, Your Honour. As at the date of 30 September, I can't say that, but, but I don't have any evidence to show that the bank was aware that this negotiation <coughs> for this amendment. That's, that's however, the, the case is however different with the other conditions subsequent um, uh, amendments. So uh, the appellant it doesn't appear to contest that it was necessary to amend the construction contract to record the new contract price that was payable to Intermass. Um, and if I can just take you to um, some witness evidence on this. And if I can uh, take you to tab 16, this is Mr. Sokhan's second statement, and it's page 289. Of volume. of volume two. This doesn't specifically mention the amendment number one or the amendment in respect to the product manager, but it does refer to other conditions subsequent obligations. Um, it reads, from June 2014, I understood from my discussions with Ms. Shocker that Mr. Almaheri was in the process of negotiating a new construction contract with Intermass in order to reflect the revised development costs and completion dates. Ms. Shocker made repeated requests to Mr. Blot for a copy of a final signed version of the revised construction contract with Intermass. And Ms. Shocker copied me into the following emails that she sent to Mr. Lott. And here you have A to, to I over page 290 and 291, a whole series of email correspondence where Ms. Shocker is, is chasing Mr. Blow for the uh, amended version of the construction contract. And um, on paragraph 24, and this is on page 292, this just refers to the receipt of amendment number 2 as um, a signed agreement between the appellant and Intermass signed and provided after the deadline date. Um, and i just refer to the, uh, the second from last sentence in, in respect of this, this amendment. So at the top, she, uh, Mr. Sh uh, Mr. Sokong refers um, to the one signed amendment and then second sentence, second to last sentence, I was aware from my discussions with Ms. Shocker that price negotiations were ongoing between Ms. Elmahari and Intermass, and that this construction contract amendment number two did not represent a final agreement between Mr. Elmahari and Intermass on the construction contract price. So this is 
too late and not good enough in terms of provision. And I'll just take you to the transcript. Uh, this is volume three. Tab 25, and this is page 506. And this is uh, Mr. Thomas's cross examination of Ms. Shocker, and I, I'm beginning on page 131. The bottom left hand page, and then um, from line 10 down to um, line 22, um, page 132. And I won't read out all of this, but it, on page 132, it records Ms. Shocker's evidence that we were advised, continuously advised by Mr. Block, I was continuously advised by Mr. Block that negotiations were ongoing for amending. For amendment number three, full stop, to evidence what he was saying, he sent me the draft of amendment number three. So this is simply a report that the bank was fully aware that there were ongoing negotiations between um, Mr. Almaheri and Intermass in respect of the necessary amendments to the construction contract, um, well beyond the deadline of uh, for provision of those conditions subsequent points. What did what point do you make of that? Um, it goes to my point on, on um, clause 5.3a that the amendment that was provided, the signed amendment number two, which was provided late, was not just late, it was not in the form, in, in form and substance that was satisfactory to the lender. Right. Well, if, you're, if you are otherwise right, the fact that it was provided late is good enough to. Yes, sir. Um, um, I, I will move on to condition subsequent number one, unless you have any further questions on the previous condition subsequent. Um, now, it's, it's common ground that no duly executed copy of the construction contract assignment was provided in connection with the amended consent agreement. The, the first argument raised by the uh, appellant is that the condition subsequent number one obligation refers to an assignment of the original construction contract from 2010 which had been provided, they say, sometime in July 2010, long before the facility agreement was amended in, in 2014. Your Honours will recall that Mr Thomas took you to some evidence, some internal evidence of the bank, which appears to contradict that. Um, so I, I, I would say it, it's been found within the judgment by Sir David Still that that previous assignment was provided, um, but there is a conflict in, in the contemporaneous evidence in respect of whether that original assignment was, was provided. But in any event, the point goes nowhere, because we say it's, it's very clear that the condition subsequent one obligation refers to an assignment of the amended construction contract. Mr Justice Giles has already gone to the definition of the construction contract assignment in the uh, amended facility agreement. There was a point raised by Mr Thomas as to some uh, apparently contradictory wording in the draft um, assignment document that was appended to the loan. Um, my point on that is simply it's a draft document um, and it's consistent, I don't have any evidence uh, to point uh, the court to, but it's consistent with a condition precedent becoming a condition subsequent by the time the amended loan is, is signed. But in any event, it's a draft assignment. I don't think you can underline the defined term of construction contract assignment in the signed amendment facility on the basis of a draft assignment document which is appended as a schedule to the loan. Now, the appellant's argument that the wording of the condition subsequent um, does not have the wording as amended after it, the duly executed copy of the construction contract assignment, and that therefore the obligation refers to the assignment of the original construction contract, we say that argument is, is just untenable. It, it's nonsensical that parties would agree on 28 September 2014 to provide the bank with an assignment that it already had years ago. 
It's also nonsensical that it was agreed on that date to assign the bank the benefit of a contract which was already out of date by 28 September 2014. We say it was open to Sir David Steele to find that this argument makes no commercial sense, as he did at paragraph 68 of the judgment. And I'll just take you to that. What he says in paragraph 68 is, the difficulty is that it makes no sense for DAS to be required to provide the very same assignment as at the date of the ARA, as that already provided four years earlier, in the circumstances, I'm persuaded that the only commercially sensible construction of the term calls for an assignment of the construction contract as amended to be provided. Now, the appellant's second argument is also uh, raised in respect of conditions subsequent to, so I'll deal with these together. Um, before moving on, I'll just recall that it's common ground that, that no duly executed original of the contractor's insurance assignment was provided in connection with the amended facility agreement. Um, the appellant raised a new and unpleaded argument in place of submissions at the trial. Uh, this is the, the argument that is repeated now on appeal. In short, uh, the appellant alleges that the parties agreed an amendment to the facility agreement which relieved the appellant from his obligation to provide the conditions subsequent one and two documents. Now that, that argument was uh, rejected in robust terms by Sir David Steele. In respect of the condition subsequent one document, the assignment of the construction contract, I will take you to um, paragraph 69 of the judgment. And this is um, halfway through, down through this paragraph. I reject this submission, which I also deal with in the context of condition subsequent number two, to which I will turn next. It is not remotely surprising that no draft was prepared. Leaving aside the uncertainty of the finality of amendment number two, amendment number one was never fully executed, and amendment number two was not fully executed until well after the deadline. It follows, if it be relevant, that Clifford Charts were not in a position to prepare the relevant drafts, even if instructed to do so. And then paragraph 72 is in respect of condition subsequent number two um, document. This is the assignment of the construction contract. This is the first sentence. I'm unable to accept this analysis, which is put forward as arising from an agreed amendment to or a waiver of the obligation on DAS to comply with the condition subsequent number. Okay, and then paragraph 73 of the judgment. The contemporary record of the arrangements as set out on Clifford Charles's table dated 14 September 2014 was to the effect that Clifford Charles were to circulate a draft once contractors' insurances are available. This latter requirement involved the need for an endorsement of the relevant policy rendering NBAD the sole loss payee. Such was never accomplished. The fact remains that conditions Number two was never satisfied, and if relevant, if Clifford Charles were not in a position to prepare the draft, such was attributable to non-compliance by DAS. And in paragraph 74, in brief, DAS has fallen a long way short of establishing an intention of the parties to amend the facility agreement to substitute NBAS legal advisors in place of DAS as the party responsible for arranging compliance with the conditions subsequent. And we say it was, it was open to Sir David Steele to reach that conclusion on the evidence before him. I will take your honours to that evidence uh, now. The appellant relies um, primarily upon certain paragraphs of Mr Al-Mahari's witness statement dated 16 January 2017. But before turning to that evidence, I'll just make a couple of points. Um, these points are relevant to the weight to be given to Mr. Al Harry's witness evidence. Mr. Al Harry had no personal involvement in the day to day communications with the defendant in respect of the conditions subsequent obligations. I don't think that's controversial. Uh, Mr. Al Harry also confirmed in his evidence on the cross examination at the hearing 
that it was Mr. Blott who was liaising with the defendant on the appellant's behalf in respect of the condition's subsequent obligations. Mr. Almaneri also confirmed under cross-examination that he had not asked Mr. Blott to appear as a witness on behalf of the appellant. So Sir David Steele was correct to note at paragraph 72 of the judgment, it must be doubtful whether Mr. Almaneri had any direct involvement in the arrangements. Those matters were in the hands of Mr. Blott. The second point is that Mr. Almaneri's witness evidence does not even go as far to allege any agreement. At most, it records Mr. Almaneri's understanding of a practice based upon his review of documents long after the fact. So if I can now take you to that witness evidence. So it's volume two, tab 12, and page 224. And it's paragraph 111. And here, Ms. Almaneri says, as a result of my inquiries after receipt of the unlawful termination letter, so this is after 21 May 2015, I have also become aware that DAS was waiting for NBAD's appointed lawyers at the relevant time, Clifford Chance, to send through the form of assignments acceptable to NBAD. So no allegation of an agreement there. Then he goes on to refer to the completion checklist. So this is a contemporaneous document. And he says, the completion checklist produced around the time of completion of the amendment agreement made clear that it was Clifford Chance's responsibility. Now, I'll take you to that document. And our argument there is it's not sufficient to establish any agreement between the bank and the appellant to amend the condition of subsequent obligations under the facility agreement. Indeed, we say this document is inconsistent with any allegation of such an agreement. If I can ask you to pick up volume six. It's tab 51. So this is the condition of subsequent table. Mr. Thomas has already taken you to this document, so it should be familiar. If you turn over the page to page 1194, this is the condition of subsequent table. And if you look at item number four, this is the condition of subsequent obligation in respect of the copy of the construction contract as amended to be executed by all parties. And you'll see in the comments current status column, it very clearly says borrower to provide. So no evidence of an agreement that Clifford Chance would bear responsibility for producing a copy of the amended construction contract. I'm sorry, would you just repeat what you were referring to? I was distracted looking at something else. I'm sorry. It's item number four in the condition of subsequent table. This refers to the condition of subsequent obligation for the amended construction agreement. And then I refer to the last column, borrower to provide. So no evidence of an agreement there. And the amended construction contract is a prerequisite to the document described at item number one, which is a duly executed original of the construction contract assignment. This is the same one that Mr. Thomas was referring to, but it's used the word pending. Is it the same thing, or is it a different one? It's not the same document. No, but is it on the same item? It covers the same condition of subsequent documents. On the same date? No. This is the 30th of September 2014. 
This the other one is pass without the fifteen. Yes, the the, the other the, the other document that you're referring to is in the run up to the, the termination notice in May 20, 2015. I don't have the date to hand, but this is no, a much much earlier. Yes. Twenty fifth April fifteen. I'm sorry. Twenty fifth April twenty fifteen. This happens on the fifth of September two thousand fourteen. <coughs> but in 2015, the matter is still pending. It's recorded in that document as 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 pending that Mr. Thomas took you to. That is what the policy is made. Yes. So it is pending, how can we now say that it is? Well, I'm, I'm dealing at the moment with the appellant's argument that there was some agreement with the bank and or Clifford Charles that Clifford Charles would take on the responsibility Yes. For producing these documents, I'm saying this document. Well, it's not with the chance, it is the responsibility of the borrower. Yes. That's the purpose of yes. this. And this document, which is uh, contemporaneous with the amended facility agreement, shows it's the borrowers who provide the amended construction contract. And although it does record in respect to the construction contract assignment CC to circulate the draft, if I'm right in my argument that the prerequisite to this document at item one is the amended construction contract. This again cannot be interpreted as any agreement that the charge would bear responsibility for. So the statement by the uh, by uh, on the uh, statement is not correct. That's what you say. In paragraph 111 is not correct. Yes. 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 <coughs> And for item number two, this is um, the duly executed original of the contractor's insurances assignment. And if you look at the comments current status um, uh, column, this very clearly states, Clifford Chance to circulate draft once contractor's insurances are available. And uh, the obligation in respect to the insurances is in row number six. Yeah. <coughs> a copy of each insurance, other than any insurances taken out by the contractor under the terms of the construction contract as amended, with the endorsement of the lender as an additional insured and sole loss payee, and it rules borrower to provide. And it's common ground that copy of this insurance with the lender as the additional insured and sole loss payee was never provided. So again, that's a prerequisite to <coughs> item number two. So Cooper Charles could not have prepared and circulated the contractor's insurance assignment because the appellant did not arrange the underlying insurance. <coughs> Named as the sole loss payee, I should add. So I'll take you back to Mr. Almahari's witness statement. So again, this is volume two, tab 12, from page um, 224. And this is paragraph. 111. Oh, sorry, 112. So it's the third sentence in paragraph 112. Miss Elmerhery says here the practice adopted by Das and Enbad in relation to the provision of the documents listed as conditions subsequent at Schedule 2 for the amended. Amendment agreement was that NBAD would liaise with Clifford Charles and then provide to DAS the final form of the assignments for execution. So these are allegations of a practice. No evidence of an agreement, no assertion of an agreement. Put away volume two now. Um, the second bit of evidence that the appellant relies upon to try and establish an agreement is. The transcript of um, Mr. Thomas's cross examination of Ms. Shocker. If I can ask you to pick up volume number three in tab 25, on page 503. Mm -hmm. 
based on the appellant's skeleton argument, the appellant relies upon the transcript from page 121, line 12, and then going over the page all the way to page 124, line 4. And I won't, of course, go through all of this transcript, but I would invite your honours to read this transcript at some, at some point. The key passage, I think, that is relied upon by the appellant is page 123 from line 15 onwards, and the question at the bottom of that page. So that was the process. The sum of these conditions subsequent wasn't it, including those two, that Clifford Charles were the party, your lawyers, we prepared the draft document, and the answer is yes. Now, my submission is that that's a weight that this transcript can't bear. This is not evidence of an agreement. This is an unpleaded argument, and this is cross-examination of the witness at the trial, and it's simply referring to process. There's no question as to an agreement, let alone an agreement to amend the express terms of the facility agreement. So based on that evidence, we say it's open, it was open to Sir David Steele to reject the appellant's argument that there was no agreed amendment to the condition of subsequent obligations. Now, I'll move on to my submissions on waiver, unless there are any questions remaining on the condition of subsequent obligations. Yes, thank you. The claimant relies upon Article 135 of the UAE Civil Code, and that's quoted at paragraph 83 of the judgment, and I'll quote it to say this, looking it up. It states, a person who remains silent shall not be deemed to have made an utterance, but silence in the face of need is tantamount to a statement and shall be regarded as an acceptance. Now, Sir David Steele approached this issue by a two-stage process. Was there silence? If there was silence, was there a need to speak? On the first question, there was ample evidence to support Sir David Steele's finding that there was no silence. The key evidence is identified in the judgment, and if we can start by looking at paragraph 85 of the judgment. And here Sir David Steele says, the starting point has to be the question whether there was silence within the meaning of Article 135, whilst it is common ground that no written complaint was made until 30 April 2015, it is clear that the point was specifically raised no later than in the meetings of 23 February, well before the further drawdown. And the reference to the further drawdown is the drawdown in March 2015 that the appellant relied upon at trial. I know Mr. Thomas has taken you to other drawdowns today, but the reason why Sir David Steele refers to well before the further drawdown is because that was the later drawdown that the appellant relied upon. So the minutes of the meeting between the bank and the appellant on 23 February 2015 is quoted at paragraph 35 of the judgment, and it's the last passage on that page. So this records, as Mr. Thomas confirmed, this evidence was accepted as being true and accurate by Sir David Steele. It states, we reiterated that the existing delays and pending conditions subsequent constitute a breach of the restructure agreement and stress that loan drawdowns are at a halt till a clear strategy forward is in place. Now, for the period prior to 23 February 2015, the judge referred to the unchallenged witness evidence of Ms. Shocker, and that appears at paragraph 86 of the judgment. 
Secretary of State, prior to that meeting, so prior to 23 February 2015, I have repeatedly said to Mr Blot that the conditions subsequent in the restatement need to be satisfied and that Mr Almeheri's continuing failure to satisfy them would lead to NBAD halting further payments under the loan. In particular, I repeatedly told Mr Blot that Mr Almeheri needed to agree an amended contract with Intermat and provide NBAD with a copy as soon as possible. Now, for the period after 23 February 2015, the judge, Sir David Steele, has referred to the bank's correspondence. So just above paragraph 86, you have the sentence. Furthermore, NBAD made a claim in correspondence in March and April 2015 that any right or remedy that NBAD might have arising from any event of default were reserved. So this refers to the express reservations of the bank's rights in the bank's letters from 18 March 2015 onwards. So we say this evidence is more than sufficient to support the conclusion that Sir David Steele reached that paragraph 86 of the judgment. So again, thus far from silence, I accept NBAD's evidence that DAS was repeatedly told that non-compliance with the conditions subsequent would lead to the halt of payments with all other rights reserved. On the question of whether there was a... Shokar is... Uh, she is... Uh, uh, she is the witness. Yes, she's a member of the bank's risk department. Yes, okay. And um, if you want to have a look at her job title, that should be evident from her first witness statement. Is it mentioned in the judgment? Um, I'm not totally sure. May I get back to you on that? Never mind, Mr. Okay, let's go on. <coughs> so, well, on the question of whether there was a need to speak, Sir David Steele notes that the factual circumstances in this case do not appear to fit within the scenarios that are contemplated in the commentary to Article 135 of the UAE Civil Code. And this is set out in paragraph 87 of the judgment. And then Sir David Steele refers to clause 30 of the facility agreement. He states that in light of this clause, it is difficult to accept that any reservation of right or other oral or written warning was needed. And clause 30 is set out at the bottom of page 11 of the judgment. States, no failure to exercise nor any delay in exercising on the part of the lender any right or remedy under the finance documents shall operate as a waiver, nor shall any single or partial exercise of any right or remedy prevent any further or other exercise or the exercise of any other right or remedy. So that's the key, key provision of clause 30. So my submission is it was open to Sir David Steele to reject the appellant's arguments on waiver on multiple independent bases. On the evidence, there was no silence. On the scope of Article 135 of the Civil Code, this does not fit the circumstances of the case. And then finally, based on the expressly agreed no waiver clause in the facility agreement, that brings me to an end of my submissions. So, open to any questions or comments that you may have. Can I just understand that last submission on the relationship between part <coughs> Sorry, no, excuse me. Make a point. No, it's all right. I, I uh, have reflected and thought better of my question. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Mr. Thomas has been going along a lot on what happened after September 30th. You know, he was referring to a lot of pending matters that were in that form. You know, what do you have to say to that? Well, there's, there's, there's two points um, on, on this. In terms of the uh, disbursements that were advanced, there's no evidence from the appellant that he understood 
that the bank was waiving any of their rights. There's no evidence whatsoever. There's no evidence internally from the bank that they believe that they were waiving their rights by making any further uh, disbursements. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, the appellant did not rely on any disbursements prior to March 2015 as evidence of waiver at trial. And then uh, Mr. Thomas referred to a, a lot of other correspondence in respect of the bank chasing for conditions subsequent in, in, well after um, February uh, 2015 and even after the uh, notice of demand. But the short point there is many of those are referring to uh, other conditions subsequent which are not the focus of the evidence of the arguments in this case. So we say that this is not, this is not particularly relevant. If we're focused on our specific condition subsequent, the evidence was before Sir David Steele, and I've taken you to the key evidence in respect of those conditions subsequent. It's on that evidence that we say the court should determine whether or not there was any way that of those specific condition subsequent obligations. Are there no further questions? Uh, thank you, Lars. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Um, I wonder if I might just take five minutes break before I make my reply. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you. Five minutes. All right.